lostness, <clears throat> the greatest problem in our world, greater than any political problem, greater than any war. And so we invite, come, come to Bethlehem, meet the Savior. Let's stand as we sing and rejoice together. O oh, come, all ye faithful. O oh, come, all ye faithful. Joyful and triumphant. O oh, come, ye, O oh, come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him. Sing choirs of angels. Sing choirs of angels. Sing in exaltation. Oh, sing on ye bright host of heaven above. Glory to God. Be seated, please. This is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is a time for preparing, preparing our hearts to meet Jesus physically when he returns to earth. But it is more than that. On the four Sundays preceding Christmas Day, we prepare to meet Jesus in a special way on the night of Christmas Eve. At that time, we intend to gather for a focused remembrance of his birth, to tell again the story of Christmas, to worship beside the manger. The preparations for our meetings with Jesus were begun long ago by God himself, many centuries before the birth of his son. God prepared a city which would serve as a birthplace for the Messiah, a place rich in royal significance in the history of Israel. He selected and prepared the seemingly insignificant city of Bethlehem to be the site for Jesus' birth. Bethlehem, where King David's family had lived for many generations, Bethlehem, where King David had been born and had grown to adulthood, Bethlehem, in whose fields King David had served as a shepherd for his father's sheep. Bethlehem, where the prophet Samuel anointed David to be the Lord's chosen king after Saul had been rejected by God because of his disobedience. Bethlehem, of which the Lord's prophetic uh, spokesman Micah said, Bethlehem, uh, Ephrath, you are one of the smallest towns in the nation of Judah. For the Lord will choose one of your people to rule the nation, someone whose family goes back to ancient times. The Lord will abandon Israel only until this ruler is born and the rest of his family returns to Israel. Like a shepherd taking care of his sheep, the ruler will lead and care for his people by the power and glorious name of the Lord his God. His people will live securely and the whole earth will follow his true greatness because he will bring peace. Bethlehem, to which Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, would take Jesus' mother Mary during the census because he was of the house and lineage of David. Bethlehem, where Mary gave birth to Jesus, 
wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. Bethlehem, to which the angel directed the shepherds after letting them know that the Savior and Messiah had been born. Bethlehem, the city to which the shepherds quickly went and found Jesus, just as they had been told. Bethlehem, where believers travel through the scriptures and the work of the Holy Spirit to gaze with adoration upon their Savior, and then tell others the good news, the promised Messiah, the Deliverer, has come. Bethlehem, the earthly city God prepared for the coming of our heavenly King. This morning, we light the first Advent candle on our Advent wreath and place the stable as the first piece of our nativity scene to remind ourselves of the place of God chose and prepare for the birth of his son Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, and our coming King. O come, all ye faithful, joyful, and triumphant. O come, O come ye to Bethlehem. Use another candle. Yes. Bethlehem, a prepared place. As the hymn says, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray, cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. Let's stand as we celebrate the coming of our Savior. O little town, O oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see the light above thy deep and dreamless sleep. How silently, how silently, how silently, the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessing of His death. No ear may hear His call. child Just 
just take our seats, please. Just a tiny nowhere town with a tiny no room in. This is where the greatest story ever told begins. We're just a tiny beating heart at all creation leaning in. The night the world forever changed because of Bethlehem. led to a stable, a baby's cry made angels sing, and the search to find a savior led to heaven's humble king, where the wise men found the answer, and the shepherds found the lamb, and I found my Emmanuel because of Bethlehem. Love is I was growing up, I struggled with a learning disability. And this is something that we first noticed when I was in first grade. I got held back. I had to repeat first grade. Um, but that did not get me on par with other students still. So all through elementary school, all through middle school, all through high school, I struggled with a learning disability. I couldn't read 
like the other students could read. I couldn't. I was really bad at math when they started putting, I was good at it until they started putting um, letters into it. You know, I thought math was just supposed to be numbers. Um, so once that started, I got bad at math. I was bad at reading, bad at math, bad at spelling. I just wasn't very good at school. And I remember being in ninth grade in my social studies class, and I would always have to get taken out of class when we would do tests, and I would have go to a special room. The teacher would help read the test to me, and I would tell her the answer I thought it was. And I was in ninth grade, and it was time to do a test, so our teacher dismissed us. And another student remarked and said, I want to go with all the stupid kids. Of course, the whole class starts laughing. And I'm just so embarrassed. Because, because what he said is what I had felt about myself for a long time. I was in ninth grade, but I I'd, I'd told myself that that's who I was for a long time. And I was well aware of my weakness and to see that other people saw it too, embarrassed me, made me feel ashamed, made me feel small, made me feel weak, and I wish that I could have hid that part of myself from them, because nobody likes being laughed at, nobody likes being picked on, nobody likes being made fun of, and this is something I'd struggled with for a long time, and it wasn't because lack of effort. Because my parents did everything they could to set me up for success. They tried everything. I tried summer reading. And I, I would do everything I could. Put in the extra work. Hours and hours of extra work that other students aren't doing. Only to be still behind where they are naturally. And that's something that I just had to deal with. And it wasn't until the last three years of my high schooling I became homeschooled because they thought maybe if we changed the format of my education, I would do better. And uh, that, that certainly helped. Um, but still, when I went to college, I was nervous going into it, because I didn't know if I was going to be smart enough to make it through college. Didn't know if I was going to be smart enough to make it through one class of college, because I still told myself that I was the stupid kid, just like the other student told me I was. And I got to college, and I'm sitting in freshman English class, and um, our school had a debate team, a speech and debate team, and the speech and debate coach came around. And I, by this time, I had figured out that I wanted to be a preacher, and I liked um, public speaking and stuff, so speech and debate interested me. Speech and debate coach came into our English class, and he's trying to get students to sign up. But I thought about it, and I was like, man, that would be so fun. But then that voice in my head said, what are you thinking, man? Like, you're not, you think you're smart enough to be, like, you, you've been in college for like a week. <laughs> and you think you're smart enough to be on the speech and debate team and like actually debate other college students who didn't, who don't have learning disability, who, who can just read like a normal person can, and you can't even do that. Yet you think you can debate, you think you can articulate thought in a powerful enough way to, to win a debate against another college student. So because of that, I didn't sign up for the team. And a year later, I've kind of blossomed at this point, did well in college, something clicked, something snapped, and I started, because my college I went to, we had to read a whole lot, so I just read a whole lot, and I kind of picked up on it, and I kind of got to the, the point that other students were at. So then sophomore year, the debate coach comes around, and he's in class, and he's asking us, and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to do it, because I regretted it all last year. I said, I'm going to at least try out. If I don't make it, I don't make it. Tried out for the team, made the team. We had a great time, loved being on the team. We hosted the state competition at my school. We debated UK, EKU, and we placed. I got top freshman, impromptu speaker. Um, we placed in debate. So basically, that's just a fancy way of saying I came home with some trophies. And those trophies meant a lot to me because that means I debated somebody else, a college student. I did good, and I, I outspoke some other college students. And, and that was a big thing for me because I had struggled for so long. But what I didn't realize about struggling, what I didn't realize about weakness is it is because of my weakness, it's because of my lack of natural ability that I developed a work ethic that normal students didn't have to have. Like, they could just 
do the minimum work and get by. I couldn't do that. I did extra work and I couldn't get by. <laughs> but when I finally made it, I brought with me the work ethic. I brought with me the strength, the compensation strength that I had developed because of the weakness. So when I finally got to the point of being average, I actually had kind of an advantage over other students because I'd always had to work harder than them just to be below where they are. So now that we're kind of on the same level, if I work harder than them, I get farther than them. And what I didn't see is that what I thought was a weakness in my life actually proved to be a strength. What I thought was an embarrassment actually turned out to be an empowerment. But I couldn't see it in that moment. And today, we're going to look at a scripture that speaks right to this. It speaks to those parts of you that you think are weak. It speaks to those parts of you that you think are embarrassing. Those parts of you that if you could, you would hide. When that student said that in that class, these are, you know, I want to go with the stupid kids. Oh, I would have done anything to be out of that room. I would have done anything to not be seen. And that's what we do with our shame. And that's what we do with our weakness is we want to hide it. We don't want to be associated with it. But I want to look at scripture today and show you something that's very powerful that I believe can set you free from those things that you want to hide in your life. So if you would, turn with me in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. You may have never heard a sermon on this. I've never heard a sermon on this verse. Never heard anybody preach about it. And I, I found it about five years ago. I vividly remember me reading this verse in like weirdly with weird amount of clarity. Like I remember... Where I was sitting, I remember the desk, I remember the lighting in the room, I remember reading this verse and thinking, wow, there's a lot in that. There's a lot I could unpack with that. And thinking about it and wrestling with it and then beginning to see my own story in this verse. If you would, please stand with me when you get there to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18. Because... He himself, speaking of Jesus, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word, God. We thank you, Lord, that your word is powerful, Lord, that your word is true, that your word speaks into our lives, Lord, and today... I ask that your word will speak into the lives, speak into the hearts, those deep crevices, those deep hidden parts of our heart and our lives that, that we tuck away, that we hide away. Lord, I pray that this word will speak into those parts, Lord. May we leave here transformed, understanding more about ourselves, more about you, more about the truth of your gospel. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There's a few things we can learn from this verse. Um, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. There's some theological to hit on first. Well, actually, first is just really practical. First thing you learn is Jesus suffered because he himself suffered, because Jesus suffered. You read the Gospels, you'll quickly see Jesus suffered. His life was not perfect in the sense that you would think it was. It was perfect in the sense that he was sinless, but it was not perfect in the way that you would think everything would go as planned. So he suffered. He went through things. He felt emotion. It's likely that Jesus lost his earthly father, Joseph. And that's not explicitly said in Scripture, but it's assumed because we don't see Joseph at the crucifixion. We don't see Joseph... At the resurrection, we really only see Joseph talked about early on in Jesus' life. So it's a fair assumption that Joseph would have been there and would have been mentioned if he was alive. So it's very likely that Jesus lost an earthly parent. He suffered the loss of his father. He felt that pain. We know Jesus felt the pain of a friend betraying him. We know Jesus felt the pain of losing a friend. We know Jesus felt the pain of being laughed at, being mocked. He felt the pain of being talked about and misunderstood. People didn't understand him. They didn't understand what he was about. 
they thought he was supposed to be something and he wasn't that, so they didn't understand. They made fun of him. They came after him. They tried everything they could to get him. And finally they did. And of course he felt the physical pain of enduring the cross of Calvary. Jesus suffered. That's the first thing we learn about this. Why is this significant? It's very significant. It's probably more significant than we would just than we would even realize. Here's two reasons why it's important to understand that Jesus suffered. Because had he not suffered every realm of, of human emotion as he did, he would not be able to sympathize with you when you're experiencing human emotion. When you're experiencing sadness, when you're experiencing depression, when you're experiencing joy, when you're experiencing temptation even, you can turn to God in the midst of your situation and say, Lord, I'm going through this hard thing right now, and I know you know what it's like. And God will say, I know it's exactly what it's like. I know exactly what you're feeling. Not just that he has knowledge of his, you know, um, omniscience, that he knows everything. But he knows experientially. He knows what it feels like. He's not just aware that you're experiencing pain. No, 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 it's not just that. He knows what it feels like. He has felt the pain that you feel. So then when you speak to him, he understands you on a level that he would otherwise not be able to understand you. So if you're taking notes on the back of your bulletin, you could write down, had he not suffered, he would not be able to sympathize with you. Had he not suffered, he would not be able to sympathize with you. Now also, second note you can write down, had he not suffered, he would not be able to save you. Had he not suffered, he would not be able to save you because it is for the, because of the physical suffering of Jesus Christ in the flesh on the cross. That is what paid the price for your sin and my sin and the sin of all of those who will put their faith into Jesus is covered because of the work that he did on the cross. And had he not suffered that, had he not went through that pain, he would not be able to save you. His suffering enables him to sympathize with you. His suffering enables him to save you. And what a, what a crazy word is that? His suffering enabled. His suffering enabled. Had he not suffered, what's the scripture say? Because he himself suffered, he is able to. We often in our lives think of suffering as a setback. Right? Right? It's a setback. We're not where we're supposed to be. We could be further along had we not encountered this suffering in our life right now. But the scripture says, had Jesus not suffered, had he not suffered, he would not have been able to. You think your suffering is a setback. God says it's a setup. I'm setting you up for something. And you're going through suffering because it's a setup. If you're taking notes, write that down. It's a setup. It's not a setback. It's a setup. We think of suffering as something that's going to disable us from doing what we want to do, from doing what we think God wants us to do. God says, no, it's not going to disable you. It's actually going to enable you. It's enabling to do you, for you to do the thing that I've called you to do. Jesus' suffering enabled him to do the purpose that he'd come to earth to do. Had he not suffered, he wouldn't be able to do it. Had he not died on that cross, he wouldn't be able to save you. Had he not been fully human, and this is one of the early heresies in the, in the Christian church, is early on in Christianity you get people saying, well, Jesus wasn't really human. He was just a spirit, or he was an illusion. And that, there's early church councils, and that became known as heresy because, and it's for that very reason. There's a saying in church history and in theology saying, he cannot redeem what he did not assume. What that means is, we're, we're talking about Christmas time, right? We, we throw around some big theological words, the incarnation of Christ. What does that mean? Well, that goes right along with he cannot redeem what he did not assume. Sounds fancy. It's really simple. If he wasn't fully human, he could not save humans. 
If he was not fully human, he could not save humans. So the problem with Jesus, thinking of Jesus as just a spirit, is we're not just a spirit. We're not just spirit. Humanity, we're not just body either. We're flesh and spirit. We're body and spirit, right? And Jesus was the same on earth. Jesus was fully human, and he was fully God. And that's important to know because if he wasn't fully human, he could not save you. And he could not sympathize with you. And that would be a really impersonal God. That's, that's God for a lot of people, right? They, they acknowledge, yeah, there's a God out there. But, but God's not just an impersonal, cold force that doesn't really understand or feel. God was fully human. Jesus was fully human and fully God. And it's important to understand that. Because you're fully human. So everything that you feel... And everything that you're tempted to do, he feels, and he was tempted to do. The only difference is, he never gave in to that temptation. And in his temptation, he never sinned. So though he felt anger, he never took it out on somebody else. Though he felt tempted to do things he shouldn't do, he never gave in to that temptation like you and I do. So had he not died, had he not suffered, he wouldn't be able to save you, he wouldn't be able to sympathize with you. And that makes sense, right? You think of suffering, when you go through something, your eyes are open to people who go through that same thing, right? So for me in my life, I've been through depression a few times. Once when I lost my great-grandfather, I was in seventh grade, I went through a lot of depression. And a counselor came to school and had to help me get back on track mentally. And then, uh, many of you know, in 2019, I was involved in a very serious burn accident in which... Uh, a fire exploded on me and, and melted 26% of my skin off of my body. And I was rushed to the hospital and I was airlifted to University of Cincinnati Burn Unit where I spent a month in intensive care having three major surgeries. Had I not gone through that, had I not gone through the depression, and, and after, the, after the physical trauma and the physical pain came the mental trauma and the mental pain, the PTSD and the depression and the anxiety. And I know what it feels like to not have motivation to get up out of bed in the morning. And I know what it feels like to feel like your life is over, like your life is ruined, like you have no will, you have no desire. Things are never going to get back to the way they used to be. I know what that feels like because I've experienced depression. I've experienced it, and I know the physical pain that comes with burns. And and I remember being in the burn unit wishing so badly that someone who had been where I was in the unit, in the bed, and I'm sitting there thinking, I didn't know I was going to be like this. I didn't know I was going to come out on the other side like this with full mobility. I didn't know. Nobody really knew. We hoped, but nobody knew. And I remember wishing that, that someone could have come in there with scars and told me, I've been where you are. I know what you're feeling. I know what you're thinking. And I'm here to tell you, you're going to get out of this. You're going to get through this. And right now I'm actually in the process of becoming a counselor to burn survivors at uh, University of Cincinnati, I'm starting that process, trying to do that so I can be that person and I can go into the burn unit and say, look, I know where you're at. I know the physical pain you feel. I know how awful it is to get your dressings changed every day and they come in and every time somebody comes in the room to do something to you, you just know it's going to be very painful. And to just see somebody come in there with scars on them and say, I've been where you're at. I know the pain you feel, and I came out on the other side, and you're going to do the same. And God's not done with you yet. Keep your head up. Don't buy into the lies that the is telling you. Had I not suffered, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Have you not gone through things? You're not able to sympathize with people who are going through those things. Your suffering is enabling you. I was 21 years old. I was going into my junior year in college. I was supposed to be back in college 
but I was at home recovering. I couldn't go back to college because I had PTSD. I couldn't physically walk upstairs. I had to have my mom's help to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom. And I was supposed to be in the dorm room. And, and there's this feeling like I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I'm not where all my friends are. I'm not where I feel like God wants me to be. But you're right where God wants you to be right now. And the suffering that you feel is not a setback. It's a setup. It's going to enable you to do the very thing that God wants you to do. Just like for me. It's done. I, I can now speak to people who are depressed because, again, I know what it feels like to not feel anything anymore. I know what it feels like when you're so hopeless you think there's never going to be hope again. I know what it feels like when you think the pain that you're going through is never going to end and you think it's never going to get better. And you finally begin to wonder, why am I even here? What's, what's the point even? And, and you know God is real and you know there's meaning to life and you know there's purpose, but you don't feel it. And that's a dangerous place to be. And I've been in that place. And I would argue even Jesus has been in that place. We see Jesus going through physical suffering. He was so stressed in the garden that he began to sweat drops of blood. And used to be all the scientists said, that's impossible. That, that just proves the Bible. Now they know there's, there's actual medical condition that people can get so stressed out that they actually begin to sweat blood. I can't tell you the name of it. I'm not a doctor, but it's out there. You can look it up. Jesus knows the pain that you're feeling. He knows the suffering that you're going through. And whenever you suffer, you know what suffering leaves? Suffering leaves people different. Suffering leaves people different. Oftentimes, suffering leaves people with scars. You've got some scars on you. I remember... After my accident, I had scars on me. You can't see it on my arms now and my hands, but they were much, where they were second degree burns, my arms and hands. And when you get a second degree burn, it melts off that, that flesh, but the skin kind of grows back. But it comes back white, like, like real white, like pale white. And I'm a little tan, I'm a little olive. So it was very noticeable on my arms and hands. And my legs were third degree burns. So all the skin on my legs, completely dead. Had to be ripped off. I have no nerves in my, my skin on my legs. I can't feel light pressure. Um, the skin was all dead, so they had to shave off the skin all around both thighs. All the way around, up both thighs. Run it through a machine, bring it down, put it on my legs from my knee to my ankles. And there's still some scars there. They look good. They look good for having been through what they've been through. But you can notice... My legs look different. But when I was going through the healing process and my arms still look so different, um, I just remember being so embarrassed because it's harder to hide your arms than it is your legs. It's kind of hard to hide your hands in the, in the middle of fall and summer. I mean, I'm not going to wear snow gloves all the time. So I'd be out at a restaurant and people would be like, man, what happened to your arms? What happened to your hands? And I wasn't ready to talk about it yet. And then I had to relive the, the trauma and the pain and tell the story that I'd been through and act like I'm okay and act like I'm ready to tell that story. But really, I wasn't. And the scars on my legs are much easier to hide. And, and, and I'm talking about physical scars, but this isn't just true for physical scars. Some of you haven't been through physical things like that, but you've been through emotional things like that. You've been through spiritual things like that and anytime there's suffering in any of those spheres of life it leaves a scar and we've been taught by the world that your scars you should be ashamed of them your scars are your shame you ought to hide it you ought to tuck it away somewhere where nobody can see it because scars carry with them painful memories of the past they carry with them shame and insecurity and we're often ashamed of what's happened to us. We're ashamed of what we've been through. 
And when we feel shame, we do exactly what Adam and Eve did in the garden. Y'all remember? They realized they were naked all of a sudden. Been naked the whole time. They finally realized it. Because they'd sin, and sin brought shame, and they experienced shame. And when they felt shame, they covered themselves with leaves. Because that's what we do with shame. We cover it. We tuck it away. We hide it. Because we don't want to deal with it. And we don't want other people to see it. If you've been through suffering, you've got some scars, and likely you try to hide those scars. You try to conceal them because you're ashamed of them, just like I was. You're ashamed of the scars, you're ashamed of the suffering. Just like I was ashamed of my learning disability. I was ashamed of my struggle. I felt stupid. I felt dumb. And, and the world tells you it's a weakness. And the world will laugh at you. Right? They might. So, so we learn pretty quickly. Hide the scar. Cover the scar. Hide the shame. And while it's hard to... Sometimes... Emotional and spiritual scars are a little bit easier to hide than physical ones. So I might walk in somewhere with shorts on, and you might think, man, this dude's been through something. But maybe you're hiding a bigger scar than just nobody can see it. Because you're hiding it with other things than clothes. You're hiding it with, with money. You're hiding it with work. You're hiding it with friendships. You're hiding it with alcohol. You're hiding it... A lot of things you can hide your scars with, right? Right? A lot of things we do in, in, in some ways to hide and conceal those parts of us that we don't want people to see because we see them as deficiencies, because we understand suffering as a setback. Because that's what we feel like it is. I mean, it sucks. Pardon, pardon the language. It sucks. And if you've been through suffering, you know it sucks. It's not fun. Right? You don't want to bring other people into that, so you hide it. You don't want, to, you don't want them to deal with that. You don't want, nobody wants to see that. Nobody wants to see the scar, man. Nobody wants to see that. Because the scar makes you look different. And you've been taught your whole life that your scars are ugly. That, that the things that have shaped you because of suffering, those are ugly things. Those are things that you should hide because they make you look different. So then what's the underlying assumption? That, that the goal is that we all look the same? I mean, we know that's not the goal. We know that's not the goal of life, but oftentimes we fall prey to that. We want to look like everybody else. We give in to that. But a scar, it makes you different. A scar is a deviation. A scar, Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a scar as a mark left where something was previously attached. A mark left where something was previously attached. In my legs, skin was previously attached. It had been melted away and ripped away. And in your life, maybe it's people, maybe it's relationships, Something was previously attached, and now it's been ripped away, and it's left a mark on you, and it's left a scar on you. So how are we going to deal with the scar? How are we to understand scars? Because they're not just physical. We go through things, again, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and, and, and we always think the scar is ugly. So we have different means of hiding it, and we hide it and tuck it away because, again, we've been taught scars equal weakness. But what if God said your scars aren't your weakness? What if God said your suffering is actually your superpower, and your scars are actually your story. How would that change our lives? 
There's this crazy thing in the Old Testament where the Israelites, who are God's chosen people, God's chosen nation in the Old Testament, um, the Israelites are going through some stuff. They're kind of having an identity crisis. And what they're doing is they're looking around at all these other nations surrounding them. And they're like, all these nations have a king. We don't have a king. Like, we need a king. Like, God, what the heck? All these other nations have a king and we don't have a king. So there's that underlying assumption, right? That we subconsciously often think the goal of life is to look like everybody else. The Israel, that's the Israelites thinking it right there. Right? Everybody else has a king, but we don't have a king. So they ask God for a king. What they don't realize is that the reason they didn't have a physical king on earth was because God wanted to be their king. They were God's chosen people. What they thought was a weakness was actually a strength. What they thought was a setback was actually a setup. What they thought was disabling them was actually enabling them to be the very people that God has called them to be. And it's the same thing in your life. The very thing that you're ashamed of, the very thing that you think is a weakness, is your secret strength. It's the thing that God has put in you that you may be seen as His. Your scars are your story. They tell of His glory. If you can understand this, if you can see this, and it may take a while, I'm not rushing anybody. It took me a little bit. It took me some time. I had to, I had to mentally process through my burns. I had to mentally process through what I had been through and the fact that God had allowed me to go through it, but God works in a crazy way. And he takes what the enemy meant for evil and he turns it for good. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I feel the Lord telling me to tell it. I know we're a little tight on time. I'm going to tell it anyways. Hope y'all don't mind. In 2019, I'm, I'll be quick. I'll be fast, okay? I know. Lunch. I know. Okay? Fried chicken is coming, okay? In 2019, summer of, tw- no, spring of 2019, uh, pastor of my home church, Andrew Brown, Grace Christian Church in Georgetown, he comes to me. He says, hey, I, I want to do a thing called Young Communicator Sunday. And Young Communicator Sunday was going to be four young people chosen to come up and speak little sermonettes. Like five to seven minute, you get to preach pretty much. And um, I said, okay, I'd love to do it. And I was going to preach on two of my favorite verses from all of Scripture. Romans 8, 28, which says that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. All things Easy things, hard things, good things, bad things, things you want to go through, things you don't want to go through. He works them all together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Even bad things, even suffering. I was going to preach on that because I'm a preacher. I just have to tell you what it means. I can't just read the verse. I have to explain it a little bit. Uh, Genesis 50, 20. Context is this. Joseph's brothers. Everybody knows the story of Joseph, right? Joseph's brothers. Joseph was different. He had the dream. His brothers were jealous. Sold him into slavery. He rose to prominence in Egypt. They didn't know it. His brothers ended up being in need and were at the mercy of Joseph um, asking for food because of a famine. And they didn't even realize the very person that they were asking for food was the brother that they sold into slavery years before. That's an awkward moment, ain't it? Uh, hey man, how you been? <laughs> Long time no see. Um, yeah, so, so they're nervous, right? Brothers are nervous. They're thinking Joseph, he's the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. They're thinking he's going to kill him. They're thinking he's going to have him sent to prison or tortured or killed or murdered. Who knows what? But Joseph looks at them and he says the, some of the most powerful words. Some of, the, some of the words of Scripture that just shaped my life more than anything else. He looks at them and he says to them, and I just imagine him looking, looking at them and saying, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. The saving of many lives. And we learn something there. That what, what his brothers did was sin. 
right? It was selfish, petty, bitterness, that, that they sold their brother into slavery, and their intention was evil. Their intention was bad. But for the same action, the same event, the same thing, Joseph being sold into slavery, God had a different intention for the same thing. What you intended for evil, God intended for good. What the devil intended for evil in your life, God intended for good. The suffering that you're going through, that the devil has a genuine intention to kill you. He has a genuine intention to end you. He has a genuine intention for this suffering, this pain, this roadblock to be the, the end of your story. But God has a different intention for the same thing. That's what I was going to preach. But I wasn't going to preach it with as much passion as I just told y'all. Because that was the spring of 2019. The summer of 2019, that, and, and Young Communicator Sunday was going to be in the fall of 2019. The summer of 2019, my accident happens. And then it's like God's seeing, do you really believe this? Let's see. You still willing to preach on it? Because at first when I was going to preach on it, I was going to talk about the loss of my grandparents and the suffering I went through then as a young child. And that kind of served as a catalyst to bring me to faith. And then 2019 hits and I go through this worst physical suffering I've ever been through and mental and emotional and spiritual. And then it's like God's seeing, do you really believe this? So, crazy thing. I'm in the hospital two and a half weeks. I go home for two weeks in between a surgery. Come back for another two weeks. The last two weeks after the third major surgery on my legs was during, I was going to be in the hospital during the time of Young Communicator Sunday. So I recorded a video talking about those same verses, but now talking about the story that I'd been through. And I was in the hospital when the video played at church. And I asked people to pray for me because I could preach it, and I know it's true. But man, it's hard to feel it's true sometimes, ain't it? Hmm. So I said, pray for me that I'll be believing this when I'm in the hospital, when you're hearing the message and I'm laying in the hospital bed in lots of pain. Pray that I'll believe it then. Because it's true, man. It's true in your life. The suffering is a setup. The scars are a story. And they tell of God's glory. If you could just see Jesus right now, I believe you'd see the scars in his hands. And what does that say? You know, we probably think when we're resurrected in this, you know, in heaven, everything's going to be perfect, right? I believe that I'm going to have the scars on my legs when I'm in heaven. I believe my resurrected, my perfected body will have these scars on my legs. Because Jesus, when he was resurrected, he still had the scars in his hands. And when you look at the scars, you see the story. When you look at my scars on my legs, actually, I got a picture to show you guys. Is there a picture? This picture right here is real important to me. Because this is the first time that I begin to believe what I'm preaching to you right now. Because for the longest time after my accident, I was so ashamed. You can kind of see on my legs the scar line there. I was so ashamed of my scars. I was so embarrassed. I never wanted to post a social media picture of them. I never I made sure there were never in any pictures. And this was a moment in my life when, when my, my paradigm shifted. And I began to see my life different. And I began to understand God's word and something God had taught me in scripture. Three years before I had read it, I thought about it. And, 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 and then I began to really believe it. Like actually believe it enough to post a picture online and let people see my scars and see that my legs look different because I begin to see that my scars are my story and that's the same thing in your life your scars whatever they are physical emotional spiritual they're not your shame they're your story just like Jesus 
And you look at the hands of Jesus, you see the suffering that he went through. And the reason he went through that suffering was to purchase you, a sinner, separated from God by your own unrighteousness. And Jesus came, and though he went through suffering, and though he went through temptation, he handled it differently than you and I do. Oftentimes we sin in our suffering. Oftentimes we turn to things that aren't of God. Jesus never did that. He never did that. Even in the midst of his suffering, he turned and he said, Lord, your will be done, not mine. And he did that because he knew you weren't going to do that. He knew you were going to have sin in your life that would separate you from him because God is holy and righteous and perfect, and we are not. And because of that, Jesus died on the cross to save you from your sin and purchase you. And now when God looks at you, he sees, <laughs> it's kind of crazy, right? When God looks at you, what's he see? He sees Jesus. He sees the suffering of Jesus. And because of Jesus' suffering, God now sees you as perfect, as flawless, as righteous. But only because of the suffering of Jesus. So my prayer is that you will begin to see your suffering and your scars as your story as the setup. Man, ask me about my scars. I'd love you. I'd love for you to. Because I can tell you the story of God's faithfulness in my life. And I can tell you, though the devil had an intention, God also had an intention. For that event in my life, and for Jesus Christ being crucified on the cross, I bet the devil thought he was winning right then. He had an intention for evil. But God had an intention for good, the saving of many souls. And I pray that your soul will be one of those. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus into your heart, and I want to invite you forward to come forward and pray with me today. I'd love to talk to you uh, more about it. Maybe you've already accepted Jesus, but you've been going through some suffering, and you've bought the lie that you're supposed to be ashamed of your suffering. You've been tucking it away. You've been hiding it. Come forward. I'd love to pray with you as well. Not my will, not my plan, not my goals, <clears throat> but yours, Lord. Have thine own way. Let's stand as we pray, please. <clears throat> Have thine own way. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. Have thine own way. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in thy presence, humbly I bow. Have thine own way. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray.
Have thine own way. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Hold o'er my being absolute sway. Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. 